Hey friends, welcome back to the Journal Feed. My name is Nick Zelt, and this is the only place to get spoon-fed the latest and greatest of emergency medicine. So what are we going to cover from this week? First off, we compare some thrombolytics. Then, in the emergency department, we do diagnose mental health disorders. But how well do we do at getting these people follow up? After that, your trauma patient didn't make it. Should you get a CT anyways? And then, what's the best way to do CPR in children? And following that, there must also be a best way to reduce a shoulder. Here we have a meta-analysis to find out how. If you are hearing this right now, then you are not currently a Journal Feed subscriber, and so you will not be receiving the full Journal Feed podcast, only getting a portion of the past week's articles. Don't worry, they're all great. But if you would like to get full access to both the podcast and the blog, then you'll have to become a member. All the details for that are at journalfeed.org. And remember, we never want money to be a barrier to better patient care. So if you're having any trouble affording a subscription, please get in touch and we'll help you out. This is the audio version of the past week summaries, which this week were brought to you by our authors, Laura Murphy, Vivian Lay, Joel Sherding, Jason Lesnick, and Clay Smith. Okay, let's skip straight to the fourth article. Titled The Effect of Hand Position on Chest Compression Quality During CPR in Young Children. Findings from the Videography and Pediatric Resuscitation, Viper, Collaborative, out of the journal Resuscitation. Now, if you've been keeping an eye on how guidelines recommend you perform CPR in children, you might have noticed a little bit of back and forth over the years. Most of these guidelines are based on mannequin studies, since it's pretty hard to do in vivo CPR technique studies in pediatrics. However, this study was just that, so kudos to the authors and, of course, the Viper Collaborative. This study was a multi-center prospective observational cohort study from three tertiary pediatric EDs. They had videography of all of their resuscitations and CPR feedback devices. The AHA gives several different options for how to do chest compressions in children. You have the thumbs on the chest with hands around the rest of the chest option. You've got two fingers, you've got one hand, or you've got two hands. These are your options. In this study, using their fancy videography, the authors were able to see which one of these techniques was used and if any stood out as being superior. What they found, unfortunately, was what we usually find, which is that we are not very good at doing chest compressions, and we fail to get the recommended depth with all techniques, even with a CPR feedback device. Pretty bad, guys. Now, the two-finger technique was not used enough to comment on in this study, which I think is very fair. You need to have fingers of steel to do that for very long. In children less than one year old, the one-hand technique came closest to following the guidelines of 3.6 to 4.4 centimeters of depth in your compressions. The depth that they actually got to, the mean depth that they got to, was 2.9 centimeters, which is still 20% away from how deep it should be. Total compliance with PALS guidelines for rate and depth was only 47%. In children over one year old, the two-hand technique was closest to guidelines, but still not quite making it. The compliance to guidelines here was a mere 24% for children aged 1 to 5 years old and even worse at 16% for children 5 to 8 years old. And this was the best technique. Don't even try to do a one-hand technique in these older kids, it looks like. The rate of compressions was pretty good for all ages. So maybe instead of drilling into everybody that you need to compress to the tune of staying alive, we should have put something in there about how hard you actually have to press. Because clearly people are good at getting the rate right, but it's really hard to get that depth right. Every time I hear about how bad we are at CPR, it shocks me to see that we don't see a lot of patient-centered outcomes and benefits from mechanical CPR when we suck so badly at this, though mechanical CPR isn't so popular in pediatrics. Keep in mind that this study did not subgroup for the truly teeny tiny little infants, so use your best judgment on those really little ones. In a spoonful, we are pretty terrible at getting the right CPR depth. For children less than one year of age, it seems like the one-handed technique is the best way to go. For older children, use the two-hand technique as you would in adults. And then the fifth and final article, titled A Systematic Review with Pairwise and Network Meta-Analysis of Closed Reduction Methods for Anterior Shoulder Dislocation out of the Annals of Emergency Medicine. 
What is more satisfying than being called to triage because the nurse picked up a shoulder dislocation right there in triage so you can do a quickie assessment and get them all teed up for that satisfying reduction. Everyone seems to have a favorite method of reducing shoulders. Each of them think it's the best method and it was passed down to them by whoever taught them. But we could follow the data on this one. I mean, there must be kind of a best way. The authors of this study meta-analyzed the problem for our benefit. They had 14 RCTs totaling 1,200 patients and network meta-analyzed it. Over 20 different techniques were described in the literature of various types. Muscle relaxation, traction, rotation, leverage, and every combination in between. So you can imagine there was some, you know, study heterogeneity involved here. All the studies were done, though, on patients at least 15 years old with acute anterior shoulder dislocations. Now, using a normal meta-analysis, there was only enough data to compare the kosher method to the Hippocratic method, and both were similar in terms of success rates, pain, and reduction time. But this is why they did a network meta-analysis, so we can get more out of this and so we can actually compare all the various different methods to each one and each other. I'm not going to go too much into the statistics, but there were some, and I don't know that much about surface area under the cumulative ranking scores anyways, so just let's just summarize. And the summary is that the boss holzak matter or Dalvos technique, which is when the patient kind of pulls on their knee and reduces it themselves, as well as the Ferris technique, which is one where the patient is lying on their back and you kind of wiggle their arm up and down while you abduct it. Both of these methods were favorable in terms of the success rates. For reduction times, the best was the Ferris maneuver and the modified external rotation maneuver. Then for pain reduction, Ferris was the best it came out on top as the least painful. In all the studies, there was only one significant complication, which was a fracture when using the kosher technique with traction. So if you want to follow the data, then the Ferris technique seems like a good place to start for a shoulder reduction. That said, no technique is ever going to be 100% successful in any patient. So no matter what, you're going to need to know a few of these. In a spoonful. In a meta-analysis of anterior shoulder dislocation techniques, the Ferris maneuver came out on top for pain reduction, success rates, and speed of reduction. The Ferris technique was similar to the boss holzak matter technique for success rates and the modified external rotation technique for speed. Okay guys, that's all that we're going to be covering from this week. Let's do a quick summary. From the fourth article, CPR is hard work. Give yourself the best odds of success. For children under one year of age, use the one-hand technique, and for older kids, use the two-handed technique. This study showed that this gave the best chances of reaching the recommended compression depths. And finally, from the fifth article, seems like, if you want to believe this meta-analysis, that the Ferris technique to reduce an anterior shoulder dislocation is likely the best place to start. Links to all the articles summarized can be found at journalfeed.org, where the newsletter is the best way to make the podcast into a bite-sized nugget of space repetition. Now, if you're feeling like you're missing out a little bit, you'd like to hear more podcasts, you'd like to get access to the blog, then please come over and join us in the members feed. Our goal here is for you to read less, learn more, and save lives, one spoonful at a time. Thank you.